Hi guys, and tonight I'm just going to do a quick test between the Sony RX10 Mark IV and the Sony A7R2. Not to do with megapixel count or anything like that, but just to see how good the RX10 is at close-up stuff. So I'm going to use the Sony A7R2 with the 105 macro lens from Sigma, and um, obviously the RX10 is a fixed lens, so. I've worked out that actually it, it focuses very closely at 600 millimeters and also back at 24. So you can go really quite close with the 24 at 24 millimeters, uh, relatively wide angle, but also you can get relatively close at 600 mil. So that should be an interesting test. And obviously the the absolute beast of the A7R2 with a uh, prime macro f2.8 lens from Sigma on it. So just be interested to see the difference. So uh, here we go, I'm just going to get snapping. Right guys, so I've set up the, uh, the A7R2 with the Sigma one, uh, 105 uh, macro lens on there. I've got a, a flash trigger, so we can set the trigger. I'll just swap that between cameras, and uh, so we can get a you know decent exposure. I'm gonna start off with the A7R. Sorry, I'm gonna start off with the uh, RX10 Mark IV at 600 millimeters, and then what I'll do is I'll take it really close and see how close I can get with the uh, the lens wide open at, at 24 millimeters. I'll see the Sony has got the prime 105 mil lens on it, so I shall do a just close up stuff just to see that there's a real difference. And uh, I should probably take one at roughly at 105 millimeters on the RX10 just to give you a similar magnification at the what? Not magnification, more the, um, the, the angle of view. And, uh, and then go from there and see what it looks like. Just out of interest, really, see what's what. So anyway, back soon. Right, so now I've got the A7R2 at a one to one ratio. I'm just gonna take a shot, and you can see there's the coin. That's interesting. Ooh. Seen that happen before? Anyway, there you go, mega sharp, one to one. And I've already taken a shot further back out. And now we move on to the the rows there. So I'm just going to move the rows over. What I've got it in, I've got it in a manual focus. And the handiness of having it on a white sheet like this is, you can move it around. So it looks about right. Like that. There you go, something like that. So, anyway, we're going to move on to the RX10 Mark IV now. So, we've got the RX10 there. Um, I've pre focused and just locked it off in manual just to, um, just to see. Oh, that one works because I took a. Yeah, that's the difference between you can't do shots. <laughs> um, so need to go into so we need to go into shutter type and just have it mechanical. Single shot. Got a two second timer. Yeah. There you go. That's way blown out. So we got two hundred. Down to ten. There we go. Just gotta re readjust it. Not bad, you know. What I'm gonna do though is go to menu, and then we're gonna go. Put 
in a different setting, sorry, a different menu to the uh, A7R2. Where is it? Large display setting on. So turn that off. Now it's good for studio work. I was just showing you the difference between if you leave it on scene setting, it gives you the exposure without flash. So as we're using a wireless system, um, it's not running a TTL system or anything like that, it doesn't know what the exposure is going to be because it doesn't know what the flash is going to do. So I've got the, set, the flash set at manual and uh, so it doesn't actually know what it's going to focus on. So auto focused onto the thing, we're at 600 millimeters. And we're at F10, um, ISO 100, and 1 200th of a second. It's probably a little bit bright for it, I imagine. Yeah, it still looks quite bright. So I'll speed the shutter up a little bit. Nice and sharp, though. Look at that. Be able to see the proper, proper image later there. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move in nice and close. It might fall over. Uh, it's stay there. What I'll do is I'll hand hold this. Because what we're going to do now is bring the RX10 in at 24mm. It's probably going to cause us trouble. But. Uh, Still pretty impressive, you know. If I take the lens head off, take the lens head off. Might even, even go even a slice of a little bit of a shadow there, but it's still focused, and it's proper sharp, proper sharp. So let's do the rows. Just do a 600ml handheld shot of the rows. Let's see how close I can get with it. Not that close. There we go. Right, so to the computer. Let's have a look at them. So, just before I uh, turn off and go to the computer, I'll just have a, a simple setup. Just a box with a white piece of acrylic in the studio with my Bowens Gemini 500 on top with an extension arm just so it's sitting over the top completely and uh, just set it like that. It's just a simple test, nothing artistic about it. It's just plenty of light for the, uh, the cameras to look at. And uh, yeah, so anyway, let's go and have a look at the computer. Right, hi guys. So on the screen we have the, on the left here, is the image from the RX10 Mark IV at 600 millimeters. And on the right hand side, we have the image from the Sony A7R2 and it was at 105 um, macro, full frame, but not at one to one magnification. It was actually about one to three or thereabouts. Um, so not at its full magnification. I'll show you a one to one shortly and you can't get the whole of the coin in, in shot at all. So anyway, but um, as you can see, the RX10 actually looks pretty good. Not too bad at all. Um, it is pretty sharp. I mean, 
there's no way you can go as big as the uh, the A7R2 just on because of its its much higher resolution and a bigger sensor. Um, it is definitely a better image. I mean, I didn't even know there was a um, where is it a signature on a two pound coin. Didn't even know it was there. BR. There you go. Look at that. Didn't even know it was there. Um, but if we compare it to the RX10, well, we get past its capability of where well, it starts to pixelate. You can still see it, but if you come back a bit, it doesn't look too bad. You can actually read it. I mean, so from 600 millimeters, it's actually pretty good. Um, this is actually only recording at 720p, so unfortunately, it may not look all that amazing as a recording, um, but on the screen, it's looking, it does actually look pretty good. Um, I mean, it's straight out of the camera, no, 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 um, you know, adjustments or anything, anything like that. And then the same with the, the Sony A7R2, um, slightly different exposure, very slightly different. Um, but actually, when you look at it like that, they're similar, or pretty much exactly the same size. The RX10 is actually pretty impressive. If you actually look at it side by side like that, just the brightness difference on the uh, from the A7R2. Um, but I'm actually relatively impressed there. That's that's pretty good. I mean, if I bring that one down a bit, just drop it very very slightly. There you go. It doesn't look too dissimilar. There we go. So anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, so that is is pretty impressive. The only real, let's say, the real difference really being is resolution comes into play. So when we zoom in, yeah, you can see the detail there of the lines and everything. But it is starting to go on, on screen here. I can see it's gone quite pixely compared to the A7R2, which I can pretty much still see a very clear detail. Um, you know, properly zoomed in there. So as a, I got even bigger. You know, as as a slight difference in you know, uh, resolution, yeah, there's a huge, quite a big difference. Um, but still, just shows you the RX10 is actually quite a capable camera. As much as people have been dissing it, yes, the noise, the noise is is apparent in in some situations. But if you use it in good light, I mean, if it's pissing with rain uh, on the and it's a bit of a murky day, how many really good pictures are you going to get outside anyway? Um, in con control conditions here, it's actually pretty good. Um, I've had some really, really good shots from it out in the daytime and out and about in, in nice light. Anything from sunshine to, you know, a little bit cloudy and everything, it's absolutely fine. A lot of the reviews we've seen, um, people are reviewing these cameras and they don't even own them. They've just had them for a couple of hours or, or whatever. And you can't, you can't learn, learn to how, if you're using a Canon or a, a Nikon or, or Hasselblad or something like that, and someone gives you a Sony or a, or a different make, doesn't matter what, what um, camera you're using, if you use a different make, it's going to take you a, a week really to learn how to you know, get the most out of it. I don't care what people say. Um, you can't just pick up anything and use it. Yeah, you can get, you know, you can, the basic functions, yes, but to work out the menu systems and, and things like that, it takes time. But um, just to, on, you know, it just proves, I mean, the fact that, you know, the, the A7R2, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to buy the A7R3 yet. I may do next year. We'll see. Um, but for now, I mean, the A7R2 is a complete beast. I don't really do sports with it, so it doesn't really bother me about the, the frame rate. Um, but then I've got the, Ace, the AR, sorry, got the um, RX10 if I want to go out and do some, you know, moving stuff and things like that. So, um, yes, the quality is considerably better on the full frame. But as an all-in-one, it's proving itself rather, rather well. I just wanted to see what the difference was between the Sony A7R2, which I knew they were going to be better shots, but it just proves how good the lens that comes with the RX10, how good it is, the Zeiss, Zeiss glass, um, compared to the uh, the Sigma uh, 105, and obviously on a full frame, 42 megapixel sensor. That Sigma lens is one of the one of the best macro lenses I've ever owned. I've had about five over the years, and um, 
I have tried the Sony, the uh, the 90 mil Sony uh, macro lens, and I decided to stay with the Sigma because there wasn't a lot in it really. The, the Sony probably is very slightly sharper, but for the money, it, it was you know I just I decided to keep the uh, the Sigma. So um, you know the, the fact that these are both out of camera and this, they're sharp as anything really. We're looking at an old coin there that's a bit battered and scratched and stuff like that. You can see everything perfectly well. Um, so you know it uh, it works rather well. So anyway, um, let's go on to the let's, let's minimise those ones. I should just leave them. There. Um, if we go to the, I'll show you the one to one. Shot. So this is this is the one to one version of that that image. So it's a full full one to one magnification on the uh, on the Sigma and the A7R2. You can even see the hair there. There's one hair, little hair stuck in a little little uh, dink or something in the uh, in the coin. Possibly another hair there stuck to it. So fine that you can you know there's another one there. It's just ridiculous. You know the detail is. Really, really good. Um, there's a pattern or something here you can see. There's obviously something that was imprinted or, or in, engraved into the middle of the coin there. So, but anyway, so that's the that's the coin. So let's move on to the rows. So this is a one to, a one to one. So this is a fake rose. It's not a real a real rose. Um, but the closer you get, the shallower your depth of field becomes. So, as you can see straight away. Even shooting at f10, it softens off very quickly in areas that are protruding. So, you know, it's a foam, a foam rose at the end of the day. So, you know, that that is um, is considerably different. I backed out slightly to uh, one to three, I think, roughly. Um, these are all straight out of the camera. I'm not touching anything. There's no sharpening or extra sharpening or anything like that. Then you can see, even then, f10. Didn't mean to do that. Whatever I've just done. Um, the F10, you can still see it blurs out. In fact, I've got a couple of spots of mark on the sensor by the looks of it, or the back of the lens. But mega sharp, lovely, and, lovely and clear. And then I did a just a, a backed out sort of um, just to get the whole thing in really. Um, didn't change any settings. Probably should have done really, but it's clear. It's not overexposed. It works, but you can see even at f10, you know I'm I'm what's probably about I don't know foot or two away. Um, you can see it, it drops out very very quickly, um, and that is why stacking is used. So you'd take say a focus point here, focus point there, focus point here, there, over on the back there, and just work your way through the depth of the image, and then on Photoshop you do your you file, you file, then your scripts, and then you'd load load files into stack. So you'd have say six or seven shots maybe for this, um, and then you would stack them all together, align them all, and then you'd merge to give you a sharp sharp image. There is some um, some separate stacking software that you can get um, if you're using macro a lot. You can try that, or if you're using say something like the uh, Canon. M, as MP65 millimeter one a uh, five to one macro lens, so you're five times magnification compared to the one, the one magnification, a one to one magnification of the uh, um, Sigma here. So let's go and have a look at the thing. So this was at 25 millimeters, I think. No, no, it was actually yeah. It was at twenty, sorry, twenty-four millimeters. This was shot at. Um, let's open that. There you go. So that was a shot at f10. So you can see the difference straight away between the the depth. Also, the the, the lighting is slightly different because the way the camera is set, but um, you can see the difference in depth. So bigger sensor. Drops out very quickly. Relatively, it starts to drop away, but not loads there. And then we've got the. This is at 600 millimeters. 
So at 24 millimeters close up, you could get really quite close to it. And this shot here is at 600 mil at f10, and it's dropped off quite nicely, but still, it's pretty sharp. So that works quite well. Um, one thing I did forget walls. Um, I didn't bother moving the lights here, so this is this is why you've got a little bit of um, shadowing. So I should have moved the light, but um, this is the coin at 24 millimeters. So wide angle, 24, around about uh, two or three inches away, maybe, maybe slightly further. Um, but there you can see it's relatively sharp. Shot at f10 again. Um, to try and get as much in focus as possible. This is what you, um, for for macro. Even though the macro lenses do f2.8, you very rarely shoot f2.8. I mean, unless you're doing portraiture or something like that, it's very different. But if you're shooting macro, you'd be shooting f10 up to f16, f18 if it does it. Um, just to try to get as much in focus as possible, because the closer you get, the the depth shallows like hugely, especially on the the one to one macros or or even the five to one macros. Or anything in between, so it makes a real big, a big impact. Um, so that's that was at 600 mil, and that was at 24. Oh, I've lost it. There you go. Um, but uh, yeah, so all round, very usable camera. I mean, feel free to leave a comment. Where's he gone? There he is. Um, there he is. Oh, for God's sake. All right. So at 24 mil, it starts to distort actually a little bit. It sort of feels like the middle's coming out out at you slightly compared to the edges. That's probably just a perspective of the lens where it's nice and flat looking, looking there. So you know it works rather well. So like I say, all in all, a really usable camera. And in studio conditions, actually surprisingly good. Um, but uh, like we know, there is downsides on every single camera that's been made out there. It doesn't matter what make it is. And uh, we can't, we or we shouldn't, really moan at the things they can and can't do. The reason the manufacturers put things in and or don't put things in is either it's not doable at the moment or they've got a better version coming that we'll have it later and that you know they haven't perfected it or something. So. Um, I suppose it also keeps you interested in the next the next gear, but you know a lot of the time people moan and and, and bitch and things like that about oh we should have bought a Canon, we should have bought a Nikon instead of the Sony, or vice versa. Um, you know, so it's yeah it's personal choice. You know they're all great, they all take amazing shots, and yes the ones might some of them might be slightly noisier than others, and yes we look at the the scientific tests that they've done in, in labs and, and things like that and compare them and it's like in the real world does it really matter not really because unless someone's taken the exact same photo next to you what's there to compare you know if someone's using a similar camera or different make camera next to you and they take exactly the same shot that's where you'll notice it you know but in the real world I could be out taking a shot and no one else has taken it I get it back it looks sharp but what's the comparison there is no other comparison so it's a sharp image you know, it's a clean image. It doesn't matter. There's, you know, it's crazy. It is a crazy world we live in. But uh, that's it for now, guys. So I just thought that might sort of open a few eyes for people who want to see how, you know, how close the RX10 Mark IV can actually focus. Um, it focuses down to, I think it's 0.92 meters, so 92 centimeters away from the subject at 600 millimeters. So it is quite usable for butterflies flying around. You know, landing on flowers and things like that, you can get a nice sharp image. Um, well, as we can see, we can take a picture of a, a two pound coin and get quite a good detailed shot out of it. Um, and you can go quite wide angle. It hasn't got a real macro function as such, but it still goes quite close. So, you know, yeah, it isn't, it, you know, it's not, you can't really compare it against a, a, a real a full time, you know, um, dedicated macro lens. So, but it's down pretty well, you know, considering, um, you know, there's not, I mean, if you put them side by side, if you were to print both images, say, A1, you know, you would probably see 
maybe a slight difference in sharpness and maybe color slightly maybe a little bit of noise difference but it's where the a7r2 comes into its own and then you can just print a billboard if you want you know so a massive billboard and it was quite happy and i know that because i've had one done so um you know that that blew me away when i drove around the corner one day and i was like ah they've printed one of my pictures at 25 feet by whatever it was 11 feet high so you know there's a big difference between sensor size and megapixels yes but still the, um, the sony rx10 mark IV as an everyday pick up and use camera you know instead of taking your gear out it's still producing extremely good shots um and uh you know going from there so i'm still loving it so anybody else who's thinking about getting one it's i would say if it's a second camera or you're not a pro and you want something that can do pretty much everything uh, at very good quality but you don't want to carry lots of lenses around or, or swap lenses and you just love taking photos it's ideal it is expensive um, but it does does do a lot of things for the money um, but uh, like I say anyway so yes here we go so please subscribe and please leave any questions below and I will try and answer them for some reason I don't get that all, all the all of the um, notifications all the time so um, please bear with me if I miss one or, or it might take me a week or two to spot it sometimes um, but uh, I will try and answer any questions if you've got any ideas for shoots or or reviews let me know and I'll try and give my real thoughts about it um, and then uh, we'll go from there but um, like I say please subscribe please click the little bell thing up the top to get the notifications that I've put a new video up and uh, yeah I'm gonna spend this two pounds now yay might buy a lottery ticket anyway uh, speak soon guys cheers